All right, so welcome to the lunchtime webinar, everyone. I'm Andrea Rice with the University of Minnesota Extension Master Gardener Program. And we have with us today Mark Seely, and he's going to be sharing information with us about climate change in our own backyard. And so with that, I will turn it over to Mark. And in Thank you, Andrea. Uh, and I'm um, uh, support to be with you today. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, climate change. Some of you I know have probably heard me talk about climate change in the past. Uh, I know I've done this uh, with various other Master Gardener chapters. Um, I'll through this uh, uh, visuals and then uh, we can take some questions if you like. I'll give a, a general uh, overview uh, of what the data show us is happening to our state and uh, also in, uh, some implications and consequences that we're observing as a result of this. First is widespread recognition that we live in one of the most highly variable climates in North America. For uh, you take today's date and you see that uh, on today's date in 1980, it's six degrees up in the Red River Valley portion of Minnesota, probably uh, high temperature for uh, this time of year. But really just three years ago, you'll see that up in St. Louis County at Embarrass, it was minus 14 on today's date, uh, the dead of winter. Uh, way back 1893, uh, Fort Rip in Minnesota was receiving 18 inches of snow on today's date. And we're left there of this slide, you'll see that we were at the peak of the Red River flooding season on the 1997 when the Red River up near the uh, Grants area border between North Dakota and Minnesota was about 16 miles wide, quite at its bank. So on any given day of the year, we can have a very, very wide range of environmental conditions. I'm going to talk about climate change in three different segments. I want to mention that uh, there is disparity in the buttes of climate change that we see, and I'll talk briefly about those. And I'll talk specifically about how temperature, uh, moisture, and water vapor is changing uh, across Minnesota and then a few associated impacts. Uh, the next slide, the color-coded uh, map of the United States is simply depicting how temperature, average annual temperature has changed over uh, the last century or so. And lights here on the landscape, as you can see looking at the US, is the pinks and reds highlight where temperature is warmed significantly, and certainly you can see that in Minnesota uh, that seems to be the case. Uh, grays and blues show the states where the temperature has actually declined over the last 100 years or so. And uh, you can see that the area of the country you live in, you in your lifetime, the temperature had changed uh, either positive or negative, and uh, to a large amplitude or a relatively modest amplitude. We're in one of the areas of the country where the positive temperature change has been rather substantial. And I show a similar geographic distribution of precipitation. And again, this is over a century or so change, and uh, it's green. And dark green is highlighting where the precipitation has increased significantly, and the yellow and brown area where the temperature has decreased. Again, looking at Minnesota's position on this map, you'll see that we live in a landscape that has seen some positive change in precipitation increase over our Minnesota landscape. Uh, the buttes that we talk about the most, and I'm not the only regional climatologist that talks about these. These are widespread in terms of our region, talked about in the Dakotas and Wisconsin, up into Canada, uh, 
Manitou, Ontario. These these are uh, attributes that are commonly spoken about in our region. The fear has warmed, uh, skewed to warm winters and higher nighttime or higher minimum temperatures. More again, precipitation has increased over most of this region with a higher variability. Is a higher disparity between those areas that are wet and dry, and a great distribution from thunderstorms. Area per attribute, which is not spoken about as often, but that the fact that our dew points have increased in our lifetime as well. We're seeing days where dew points. Our annual temperature curve in Minnesota, from all observations collected in the state since the late 19th century, and the, the seat as a whole, the mean annual temperature has increased by about two degrees. Up. The inside of, of this graphic, where you see me moving the cursor, states that the uh, we, we have indeed seen a lot of extraordinarily warm years prevail in our lifetime, uh, and. Um, that continues to be the case. Uh, the net I'm showing you is the seasonal description of temperature trends in the state. Uh, December temperature trend, that is for the months of December, January, and February, is a slope of about four degrees per century, as opposed to less magnitude in the other seasons of the year. Degrees upward in spring, degrees upward in autumn, is one degree increase in the summer. Uh, by sight, though, as we look around the state, we take, for example, the temperature change at a place like Wilmer, located out in Candy, Ojai County, in the central part of the state. And we temperature change on a month-by-month -month basis has been prolifically positive there, some with a larger temperature shift than others. Uh, nevertheless, pretty significant. Uh, we can also look at a place like Red Wing down on the Mississippi River, and we see prolific positive temperature change that's occurred in the uh, community uh, and communities along the Mississippi River Basin. And next slide. This shows that winter minimum temperature has increased by far the most statistically from all our temperature measurements. Simply a statewide depiction of December, January, and February minimum temperature. See that this has an upward slope of five degrees per century. So most of the temperature change state is uh, skewed to the winter season, and notably skewed to the nighttime minimum rather than than the daytime maximum. And that illustrates. It's that disparity between an increase in the day maximum and an increase in the night minimum, because depicted here is a graphic that shows you the net change in average monthly maximum temperature, the red bar, and then an average monthly minimum temperature, the blue bar. And this illustrates uh, for our state is that we live in an area of our country where the minimum temperature is seen at roughly twice the pace of the temperature, both changing in the positive direction, that is, both getting warmer, more, much more rapidly than the maximum. As of this, we do see a change in the length of the growing season, which is depicted on the next uh, graphic. That is, spring frost is coming earlier on the calendar, and the frost frost uh, in Minnesota is coming later on the calendar. And as a result, the growing season has lengthened anywhere from nine to seventeen days across the state. Eight. A longer growing season, if you will, to take advantage of for frost sensitive plants. sensitive plants. We all note that our climate statistics show that the um, plant hardiness zones have expanded in the state. 
we have a larger geographic area of the state that now falls in zone 4A and 4B for uh, plants to landscape with. See, we also now have parts of the state that fall into zone 5A, which is a broader uh, range of landscape plants that might be uh, um, grow here in the uh, zone 5A. Formerly in our state history, we had no section uh, of a zone 5 anywhere in the state because of the climate behavior. But uh, now, and increasingly so, I would expect these zones might even expand more as we go decade by decade into the future. So this we've seen of these warm uh, or elevated temperatures are that our soils and lakes don't freeze as long. Uh, material left by farmers tends to break down more rapidly as soil temperatures stay warmer. Uh, allergy season. Now, for those of you that suffer from those maladies, a uh, mold and allergen season has been lengthened by these temperature changes in our state. In fact, there our own no clinic in Rochester has written kind of uh, extensively about this. Uh, and these and other organisms uh, now in of suffering uh, high mortality rates winter after winter in our state. Uh, now many of these uh, survive and reestablish earlier in the spring season. We now have thaw cycles uh, in play across the Minnesota landscape as we don't fall below the scene and remain there for days and weeks like we once did in the winters of long ago. Uh, I mentioned growing seasons already and generally less heating degree day. So for the heat of our businesses and residences uh, around the state, we now, during heating season, typically have less heating degree days to cope with. And that I'm showing you the precipitation description of change in Minnesota. This one is all observations, again, back to the late 19th century. Remarkable drought years of 1910. And uh, 1976 uh, on the uh, graphic here, but those at the upper trend line through this is a increase uh, of about 2.6 inches over a century. And the right hand side here, we have been populated in recent years by a number of extraordinary wet years, uh, and, um, and through uh, almost anywhere you look in the state. And so that. The normals or the averages of change. Here's a, a tabular description of the averages for the Twin Cities, for example. We've seen a 20% increase in precipitation from the most period of 1941 to 1970, and also incorporating the modern, what we call the modern normals period of 1981 to 2010. Uh, look elsewhere around the state at any of a number of locations and see similar increases here at Faribault. Uh, the increase has been 31% in precipitation and average annual precipitation. Used by the way, I neglected to mention this at the outset. That I'm sure many of you are already aware of this. You can find these changes for particular location if you use our website at climate.umn.edu uh, will get you there. And you can look at these for many specific locations in Minnesota. In that signal change of precipitation change in our Minnesota landscape is the fact that there's been a character change as well. And that character change manifests itself as is more intense convective thunderstorm rainfalls, the types that deliver uh, two inches, three inches, four inches, etc. And in the Great Lakes region, the National Weather Service has been, done a study depicted on the map in front of you that shows around the Great Lakes region. We have a 37% rise in these intense heavy thun thunderstorm rainfall events. To go back too far in time to realize this, we go back to June of 2014 
when thunderstorm after thunderstorm after thunderstorm crossed the state, producing the most singular month in Minnesota state history. The uh, listing there of many communities, some of which you'll recognize, that had all-time monthly rainfall totals pre in that June 2014. And we had many individual observers in our uh, network around the state report two of the 30 days in June of 2014 delivered rainfall. So really an extraordinary rainy month that, that was that year. We all understand rainfall is all about who gets it and who doesn't. We have these very, very unusual situations develop. This one is showing you the summer of 2012. And the map in front of you shows um, gold and red coloration in some of the counties. Those counties that were declared by USDA to be in drought disaster, severe to extreme drought prevailed in those counties in the summer of 2012. And so we see on this map some plans embedded in some of these counties. Counties declared by FEMA the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as flood disasters in 2012. So we had a single moment in time in the summer of 2012. We had residents of Minnesota that involved with the federal government for drought assistance or flood assistance and it's existing on the same county landscape. So being the very erratic behavior system, deliver abundant rainfall uh, in some cases, but absence of meal rainfall in most cases that particular summer. History is depicted in some of my books. The Minnesota Weather Almanac for Minnesota Historical Society has the narrative about all of Minnesota's historic droughts. And the millennium, since the year 2000, we've had drought visits to Minnesota land landscape quite consistently. Not always, not in the same geographic location. It tends to move around the state. But uh, obviously moisture conservation under this scenario has become very, very important. To serve the moisture in the soil is a, is a very important management factor that we've had to take into consideration with uh, drought visiting some part of state very frequently. Uh, again, we've had some rather horrific rainfall events prevail. Now, now here I'm showing a slide that depicts the mega rainstorms. Now, what do I mean by that? The American Association of State Climatologists has defined the mega rainstorm as uh, an area of a thousand square miles, six inches or greater precipitation single day, with a soar value of eight inches or greater. Here's the end of such storms that have occurred in Minnesota. We'll see that over about the first 140 years of our state history, we have seven such storms. But since 2002, we've had five more. And they delivered very devastating amounts, 10, 12, 14, even up to 15 inches of rainfall that have been very, very damaging to the uh, Minnesota landscape. It was the a geographic depiction of the most recent five mega rainstorms across Minnesota. And what these are similar, by the way, to something that's been in the news this week, which are devastating floods down in the Houston, Texas area. These would qualify as the mega rainstorms as well. We got anywhere from five to, I think, as much as 16, 17 inches of rain down in the Houston area. Very damaging to the not only the landscape around there, but the infrastructure of storms these were here in Minnesota for us, um, and many of you may have personally experienced some of these storms. Uh, 
Uh, I think once you experience a storm of this magnitude, you certainly don't forget it. As of this change in precipitation, of course, we see many things uh, happen. Uh, we've had to give more attention to uh, tile drainage, runoff sediment, shoreline management aspects of our, our uh, Minnesota uh, uh, system. Uh, Arm sewer runoff systems have, and culverts have been redesigned to accommodate a higher volume. Uh, uh, er erosion with buffers, contours, and cover crops remains a very important uh, management aspect in our state. Even debate as we speak in the Minnesota legislature this winter. Uh, just to protect oil and conserve moisture, uh, much more, I, I guess, uh, important to them in the past. Lots of aviation projects have gone on around uh, watersheds in the state, and then there's been impacts on our insurance rates that we pay relative to these uh, devastating flash floods and things of that nature. Uh, lastly, we've seen changes in dew point. Uh, our dew point uh, episodes of 70 degrees or higher have increased in frequency, not in the southern part of the state, but in the northern part of the state as well, even as far as Voyager's National Park, which is all the way up on the Canadian border. Now, 70 degree dew point is a defined criteria. I might add, of what we call a tropical air mass. So when a weather broadcaster is referring to a tropical air mass, it's typically associated with a dew point 70 degrees or higher. Take the heat index and make the outside air temperature feel extraordinarily hot. The National Weather Service in our state is obligated to release a heat advisory every time the Heat index expected to go to 100 degrees or higher, and had multiple episodes of this in our lifetime. The actual 100 degree temperature reading on the thermometer have all by the wayside. We don't see that very often in our Minnesota climate, but we see conditions where the dew points go so high that we indeed get heat index values well over 100 even into the 120s and as high as 130, 134 back in summer of 2011. Speaking of that horrible summer heat wave of 2011, these were the all-time record heat index values that came that day, uh, July 19th, uh, and the end of the 20th on 2011. Very oppressive, actually health threatening, not only damaging, particularly to perhaps uh, uh, garden garden uh, crops, but uh, damaging to human beings. And, uh, health, uh, a real health threat. These pre prevent such a health threat that it's real important to take good care of yourself and stay hydrated and certainly spend time in the shade or the air conditioning. Uh, that's an uh, overall view. To wrap up here, I've uh, uh, talked about that uh, the climate is changing, climate changing significantly in Minnesota. We see that in our data that we're well over 140 years. Uh, there are certain coherent consequences associated with those changes, and that we need to uh, seriously consider this management of um, of the environment around us because uh, both our infrastructure and our natural resources are affected by these changes in climate and uh, this is an important issue of our time it's not going to suddenly go away probably in, it's going to be with the next generation as well and uh, factoring that into the way we go about doing things range it's a very, very important part of our lives. And so I'll conclude my remarks with that, Andrea. And uh, if you have people online who have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Yeah, we have questions coming in. And if you come up with some questions, the audience out there, put them in the chat box, and then we'll get some responses to them. So here's the first question about rainfall. I heard somewhere that we should expect to see more rain in spring and fall 
and less moisture during the summer and winter. Is that accurate and why? The, the trend lines in uh, our recent historical data do show that uh, spring and autumn uh, show a relatively larger increase in precipitation uh, due to the winter and summer seasons. Uh, spring and autumn are transition seasons, and uh, with transition seasons, we get both convective thunderstorms, but we also get what we call the large scale, what meteorologists call mesocyclones that pass across the state and deliver a large swath of precipitation. In fact, singular month of the year, of the 12 month of the year, the singular month of the year that shows the most precipitation increase is the month we're in right now, uh, April. It is, uh, shows of the 12 months the largest monthly increase in precipitation. Okay, another one. What it's going to take to convince the believers that climate change is actually happening? We're not uh, I'm necessarily an expert at that, although I talk about this topic a lot and my experience in talking about it a lot is that, that uh, I titled uh, my typical presentation, Climate Change in Your Own Backyard, I talk about what's happening here and what consequences are. I think, uh, you know, we're not all privileged to look at the uh, all data and analyze the data for ourselves. We see what's happening to the world around us. And more and more here in Minnesota, we see um, the consequences of climate change playing out in a variety of ways, some of which I listed in this presentation. But when we think about indeed species, certainly climate change is in play with respect to invasive species in that the changes in climate open up new niches for species to survive here, be they aquatic species that live in our water bodies or terrestrial species. We've seen changes in bird migration patterns. We've seen changes in plant disease, uh, insect populations, uh, changes in health threats. Transportation uh, system suffers from climate change with more freeze-thaw cycles, so we're having to spend more time fixing our roads. So there's a lot of consequential evidence that has been built up that I think all of us can relate to perhaps more so simply looking at how the data have changed. And I guess for the average Minnesota citizen, that might be the best context to have a conversation about it. The questions coming in are asking about uh, rain and temperatures, like this next one. Will we expect the normal April rains this year. My garden is just dusty due to no rain. <laughs> yeah, certainly more of an immediate uh, need, isn't it? Yeah, most places, uh, well, uh, a large number of observers this month report a lack of average rainfall, but it looks like, uh, if you've been following the forecast, it looks like the second half of the month is going to deliver more frequent chances for rainfall. So I think over the next two weeks, we might be doing some catching up. And, um, and so we'll see how, how that plays out. Our, our rescue or our buffer from this current situation is, and what everybody I think should understand is our soils currently hold above average amounts of moisture because of the abundant storage of what we put in the soil last autumn. Last autumn, all the way into December, because the soils didn't freeze up early this year, in fact, they froze up late, we benefited from additions of precipitation into the soil moisture around our region. And so, uh, although we're in a dry pattern now, though the first few inches in the soil, we have uh, very good soil moisture storage throughout the state right now. Uh, one, please repeat the info on growing season for frost-free days increasing. I said 
about nine days longer now. Is this for all of Minnesota or just central Minnesota? The range across the state in the lengthening of the growing season, uh, this is this is not a range, okay? It's been from as few as nine nine days longer growing season in parts of southern Minnesota. So by that I would mean down, say, if you're in the Rochester, Mankato, Albert Lee section area of the state. But Minnesota, it's even been more amplified. If you're up in the Park Rapids, Bemidji, uh, Crookston, uh, Roseau area of the state, the growth has expanded up there by as much as 15 to 17 days. So that's the general range across the state that we are now seeing the longer growing season. Hey, okay, excellent. Um, Dr. Hoffman, you had a I think we will also see more tomatoes in Minnesota with the climate change. I, not myself, but others have looked at this uh, and, and we don't see a trend that we can say is a meaningful trend yet. We do see that uh, we're having a trend in uh, more frequent severe thunderstorms. So. From the standpoint of thunderstorms that deliver uh, these intense rainfalls with thunder and lightning and straight line winds and large hail, we see an increase in the frequency of those, but we don't yet see a statistically significant increase in the number of tornadoes. Uh, that may yet play out as we go into the future because we've deployed so much new technology we don't miss a tornado anymore in our uh, observational network around the state. But uh, one we're still uncertain about. Okay, and it's maybe kind of a follow-up. Uh, this person lives just in Red Wing, but that we don't get the same severity of weather. And they're wanting to know if there's a dividing, where the dividing line is and does the river affect Red winged weather. Uh, with respect to severe thunderstorms, I don't know that the landscape has a huge effect there on severe thunderstorm or, or severe weather development. Um, I want to look precisely at the Red Wing statistics to note whether they have not been seeing this so called increase in, thunder, increase in thunderstorm activity. So it's not uniform across the state. So we uh, would be careful that um, one of the things I do before I retire is I'll try to regionalize this a little bit so that we can pick out the geographic areas that are seeing the most increase in severe weather from those that are uh, seeing the least increase in severe weather. But I don't know precisely what it is for Red Wing. know if they could plant their garden earlier this year rather than wait until May 15th for the day of frost. I do. Now, I'm taking a bit of a risk in saying that because the new seasonal climate outlooks will be released by the government tomorrow. So, actually, I'm a day ahead here. But uh, all indications from the models I've looked at are that we're going to continue to have a warmer than average spring and early summer. And so given that the odds are stacked in favor of that, I kind of think we might be a bit safer to plant things earlier uh, rather than for the average dates or later dates to go about doing that kind of work. So, yes, yeah, I would be leaning statistically. Basically, I would be leaning in that direction this year because of what the uh, climate models are suggesting. Okay, then uh, I've been talking with their insurance agent, and their insurance agent says that Minnesota is designated a disaster state, and they want to know if that's accurate, and is that enough to account for an increase in their rates, I guess. Yeah, the insurance industry is an interesting uh, a player in this climate change and how it plays out scenario because 
they already responded quite, fr- and you probably have already seen this reflected in your bills. We had the president of the Insurance Federation of Minnesota speak to us at a conference a couple of years ago, and many of our insurance premiums have already been adjusted. The rate we pay today have already been adjusted as a result of the number of severe uh, weather events and episodes that we've had play out in Minnesota that have been quite uh, consequential. Uh, Minnesota is uh, one of the Midwestern states that's seen some of the largest rises or or rises in premiums, insurance premiums, uh, as a result of analyzing the climate statistics. So uh, you're right in observing that, and the insurance person is being perfectly honest in saying that that has been a factor weighing the changes in premiums that we pay now for, say, 10 or 20 years ago. And I have a question um, looking at my gardeners and their impact in their communities and this is a, a big issue um, you know, buddy, but also for master gardeners and going out and being a part of their communities. So what would be the takeaway for them? What they do to either combat climate change or just what do in their landscape to address this issue? Uh, an expert on uh, climate mitigation, uh, that is, uh, we, you know, what we'll, we can do to mitigate this. There's a whole other state committee that deals with that. Certainly, we we need to be more uh, uh, cognizant, more aware of uh, how we emit things into the atmosphere. Uh, you know, how much water we consume, what our carbon footprint is, and the, the usual jargon that is associated with mitigation activities. I think that's very important, and I don't want to dismiss that at all. M- my work has been in the adaptation. The adaptation side is how do we adapt? Now, master gardeners role models for adapting the landscape and how we treat the landscape to changes in climate by uh, the, uh, what plant, uh, how they manage, how they protect the soil, how they conserve moisture, how they uh, adjust for or combat threats of plant diseases or insects. And I think just spreading the word and talking about it, you serve as a role model for adapting to climate change because uh, the love of gardening and, 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 and of that nature is a love so many Minnesotans share that a golden opportunity to serve as a role model for adjusting or adapting to climate change and talking about what you're doing and doing differently to protect the soil and still grow uh, some of the plants that you you favor, plants that you like, and things of that nature. So it serves as a platform, really, as I see it, for people to see or witness how we might adapt to the changing climate. Okay, great. Well, I'm getting questions coming in, um, but we this is recorded and we'll have it posted to our webinar site uh, in a, a couple of days. And um, thank you all much for joining us today. This is really, really informative and interesting, I think, especially with the noticeable change in the way that has happened from a few weeks ago to today. So thank you so much, Mark, for all the great information. Well, you're welcome, Andrea. Uh, thank you very much for letting me join in. And everybody have a good day and uh, and that we have a, uh, a nice dose of uh, Mother Nature's uh, can the rest of this month. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much. And just a quick reminder that as we end this, uh, we will pop up with our survey. So please take the time to fill out that survey for us and give us some feedback on the webinar. So just to echo Mark, everyone, enjoy the day, and we'll see you next week.